Amen. Today is Easter Sunday. Have you been figured it out? I mean, it's like this every Sunday, but actually it is theologically. We, we, we are here to remember all that Jesus did in his death, resurrection, and today we are celebrating both in music and word, and you'll have an opportunity to participate as well as the hymns we sing today, many of which you'll know. Uh, we even have some contemporary music that we'll be bringing in to celebrate completely what we call the most important event in the history of Christianity and really in our lives. If you don't know me, my name is Tony Osmo, and I have the privilege of being the pastor here at Community Presbyterian Church. If you're a visitor, welcome. We are glad you're here today, and I hope you feel yourself uh, welcomed and at home. And after the service today, we will have a, a time to get together for coffee and all kinds of amazing treats. Uh, because you're here today, it's free. It's on me today. Um, it's... <laughs> Actually, on the fellowship committee and the deacons. The deacons put that together. But we invite you to join us afterwards for a time of, of fellowship and coffee and getting a chance to say hello. Because I know some of you, this may be uh, one of those opportunities where you haven't seen your neighbors or friends in a while. And this would be a great time to join us. Well, let me invite you now to, to settle in. We're going to be here for the next four hours to... Uh, um, I've looked at my sermon. It is long. <laughs> that was for Harry. Uh, but... yeah. I don't get paid by the word, Harry. Come on. Just... Now, we're, we're here to set aside what's gone on this week and focus for this next hour just to remember what Jesus has done for us and why we celebrate today. And this is an incredible day to celebrate. Let me read to you to prepare your hearts for worship. This is from Psalm 118. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. The stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it's wonderful to see. This is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Bless the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Lord, this morning on this Easter Sunday, we have come to celebrate, to remember, to reflect to catch up with old friends and make new ones. I pray that all that we do today would bring glory and honor to your name, for it is what you have done, not what we are doing, that is so important today. God, thank you for this time to gather together in worship. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Happy Easter morning to you. Okay, guess what word God gave me for this week? Easter eggs. A lot of people do things with Easter eggs on Easter. Oh, they like to dye their Easter eggs. They're, I've been seeing on the news all these Easter egg hunts that are going on. And I got to thinking to myself, well, what does an Easter egg really have to do with the true story of Easter? Let me share something with you. The story begins when Jesus was crucified on the cross and he died on the cross. After his death on the cross, he was placed in a tomb, a place where he was buried. It was like a cave, and he was put in there. And a really huge, big stone was rolled across the opening. But three days later, on Sunday morning, some women came because they were very sad, and they wanted to show their respects to Jesus, respect to Jesus, but when they got there, that big, huge stone was rolled away. They were totally amazed by that. And even more so, they were amazed when they walked inside because there wasn't anybody in that cave. Jesus wasn't even there. Then an angel came. And the angel said, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who is crucified. He is not here. He is not here because he is risen, just as he said. The tomb was empty. Jesus had risen. And he rose for us so that we could have eternal life with him forever. That is true love, to be willing to give up your life for someone so that they can live forever with you. But I come back to the question, what, does this, what do the eggs have to do with all of this? Well, just as a little chick breaks out of the egg as a new life, Jesus broke out of the tomb of death a new life as our risen savior. He conquered death so that we might have everlasting life. Okay, I just can't stand this any longer. I've got this Easter egg here. I just really, really want to break this egg. It's harder than I think. <gasps> it's empty just like the tomb was empty. <laughs> and I made a mess of the carpet. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> the, the egg is empty, the tomb was empty, because Jesus is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for this Easter morning when we remember the sacrifice of your son Jesus on the cross and his glorious resurrection for our salvation. Please bless these children with your great love. He is risen. He is risen indeed. When you see an egg the next time, you think about how Jesus broke out of the tomb of death so that we could be saved. I have a little egg for each of you to take with you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Welcome. Have a blessed Easter.
Happy Easter, everyone. In 2 Corinthians, Paul wrote, For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. After his resurrection, when Jesus appeared to his disciples, his first words to them were, Peace be with you. And I believe that that would be Jesus' words to us today. Peace be with you. Please join us as we pray. Lord, we thank you for the gift of your Son. And as it says in 1 Peter, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven, heaven for you. Lord, we come to you with our needs and our wants. We pray for peace in our world, the end of wars, the end of violence, the end of persecution. And we pray for those that are experiencing fear, anxiety, loneliness, fighting addiction, those with have, that have broken relationships, uh, those that are in physical ill health, many long-term illnesses that we've been praying for for a long time. And Lord, we lift up all of those. We lift up our needs, our desires, our wants. You want us to bring them to you. You say that nothing is too big or too little to, to ask you for. And we come to you asking you to work in all of these situations. Those unspoken prayer requests that people have in their heart, I pray that you would minister to those, that you would meet people in their need, and that they would know that you love them and care about them. As we worship you today and rejoice in the resurrection of your son, may we uh, be grateful, may we be thankful, and may we commit ourselves again to, to work, to serve you, to live for you, and to glorify your name. It's in the powerful name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Christ the Lord is risen today. Oh, hallelujah.
Oh 
some amazing people in our congregation. Last week, I, as a sermon illustration, I talked about a time when I was in Sunday school in first grade, and I, we were all challenged to memorize scripture, which I did, and it was, uh, uh, Jesus wept, you know, wasn't much of one, and how a girl had memorized John 3.16, and she got a full candy bar, and I just got a little thing. And one of our members, as I came in today, left this <laughs> on here. So God bless you. Today I'm going to be talking about an illustration when in high school I memorized the Westminster Confessions, hoping for a 911 Porsche convertible. Um, did get it. I like white, by the way, for cars. No. For those of you who are watching at home, welcome. We are so glad you were here, uh, maybe not physically, but watching on your screens, and you are at, at just as much a part of our congregation today as those of us who are in here. I've been going through a, a series, and it actually concludes next week, that we're calling uh, Road to Redemption. And we've been looking at different places in Israel where Jesus stopped and said something significant or did a miracle or did something special. Today is no exception. 
And one of the things that I've been doing through this series has been showing pictures. So I kind of anticipate this. I took this trip uh, along with my wife, Anne, in November of 2022, knowing that someday I'd get to use these pictures. So today, you get stuck with some of my pictures today. Uh, but don't worry, I don't have that many pictures for you. But before we get into that, let me invite you to pray with me. God, on this Resurrection Sunday, I pray that you would give me the words to say. We thank you for this amazing day that we celebrate even though we celebrate this every Sunday, it is the reason why we exist as followers of Jesus Christ. I pray today would be a special day, that <clears throat> there would be meaning in what we remember and celebrate. Give me the words to say, and I ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you've ever been to Israel, one of the things that you notice right away is, depending on your tour guide, whether they're Jewish or Christian, they'll take you to a lot of sites and they'll say, well, this may have been the site of such and such, or this might be one of the sites. And it's, it can be a little daunting and sometimes even frustrating as you go to a site that they claim, here is where the empty tomb was, only to be told, well, and it could also be up on that hill over there, and it could be down in the valley, and it could be this, it could be that. And the empty tomb is no exception. Let me show you some pictures. There's two sites in Israel that are often thought to be the tomb of Jesus. And the reason is, is they are tombs, and you can make a lot of money by saying Jesus was here. <laughs> so uh, the garden tomb is actually run by a British organization that um, it could have been a tomb. It's probably the most well-known tomb in Jerusalem as you, you tower through. Um, so just thought that was a cute picture just to tell it you were. If you'll go to the next picture. Here's a diagram of the tomb you're about to see. And this, this is a typical burial chamber. There's an antechamber off to the side, and there's three sections. I'm showing you this picture because the, the inside pictures that I have uh, are, are not that great. Um, I actually, when we went to the, the tomb, we, there were 30 of us, 30 pastors and our spouses, and COVID was going through the bus like crazy. And I managed to hold it off until the last day, which was the day of going to the tomb. So I wasn't in great shape taking pictures and infecting half the known world because uh, I didn't know I had it. But if you go to the next picture, I'll show you what it looks like. If you come up, you, this is what a typical tomb was. And if you've ever been to Israel, there's limestone everywhere. In fact, that picture in the very beginning where it says CPCC Easter, and you see all those little boxes leading up to the temple, those are all ossuaries and actually burial sites. Because you can't bury people in Israel. It's, it's limestone. Every time it rains, like it did this weekend, everything percolates to the top. And then you get these creepy zombie movies that come out of that. Um, so they have to bury people above ground. And because there's a lot of limestone in caves, that's just naturally where they buried people. So this particular tomb, the garden tomb, is close by a road that the Romans would have used to put the cross. And you know, that, that's a Good Friday sermon in itself. But this would have been close proximity, so this may have been the tomb, probably wasn't because it's a really nice garden and there's an olive press there and some other things. But if you want to go to the next picture, this is what it looks like on the inside. You know, they, they, there's the burial chambers and you can see, and in the Jewish tradition of burial, when a person died, they would wrap them, they would care for the body, they would lay the body in one of these tombs for a year. And then that time, nature takes its course, and when they come back on the year anniversary, there's just bones left, and they would make these boxes that they call ossuaries. And it was the size of the thigh bone, which is the longest bone in the body, and they'd put all the bones into that box and then put that out. They wouldn't bury it, but they would put that outside. So it was kind of like a, a holding chamber for a year. And that year was a time of mourning, and then when the, the bones were placed down, that was when officially mourning ended. I think there's one more picture of the inside. Oh, no. So there's a second place. This is a really interesting site. If you ever go, it's called the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre is actually three churches, well, four churches, if you count the Ethiopians, uh, that they, they take this site that they think is the burial place. So the, these are the two places that argue over the actual burial site. And this is one of those places where it's really hard to imagine because... There was a cave, and you can see it inside this little church that's been there forever. And then another denomination, actually the Roman Catholic and the Greek Orthodox got together, and they built a church over this church. If you go to the next picture, I'll give you a little, there, there's looking up. I shot this up to, so you could see, you know, this is like a big cathedral. If you go to the next one, give you a shot looking down. That, so we're in a church with a church on the roof, 
looking down at this little church that is traditionally the site of where Jesus was buried. And they think that because in a rock, I didn't put this picture up because I didn't ask my wife's permission because she's actually inside this little thing touching it, is a place where a cross was dropped because this was the hill that they think might have been Golgotha, which means place of the skull, and just down from that was this cave and burial. So those two spots are traditionally where the empty tomb is located. I show you those because, you know, I just saved you $5,000 going to Israel. Um, you can put that in the offering afterwards. Uh, no. no, the point is this. You know, we, we celebrate Holy Week over this week every year, and it's the weekend leading up to Easter, which we know is a brutal week for Jesus. He has, uh, on Monday, Thursday, which is the new commandment he gives to his disciples, he has a wonderful Passover Seder, the last one that he has with him, and he knows it's going to be at that dinner that Judas betrays him. That night, Judas betrays him with a kiss. He is arrested. Uh, he's tried at night in an illegal gathering of the religious leaders that condemn him, and they, they try to, to, to destroy him. But they're not allowed to kill him. They have to take him to their Roman overlords to do that. So they take Jesus that weekend, and they take him to Pontius Pilate. They take him hoping that he will be... Uh, killed by the, the Romans, and the Romans examine him and say, we didn't find nothing wrong with him. What, you know, how about we, we, we let him go? And they're, no, no, no. It's, you know the story. Um, they take him to the cross. But before he gets there, he brutally is, is beaten. He has to carry his own cross the long way, the Via Della Rosa, which we remember the road of sorrows as he goes to the cross. The Romans were exceptionally brutal in crucifixion. In fact, crucifixion was reserved for slaves and insurrectionists. It wasn't something they would typically do and no, never done to a Roman citizen. But it was meant to be a warning. They would put the victim on the cross, and on the cross, they would die of asphyxiation because they had to push themselves up to get a breath and then come back down. And it, it was meant to be a long, slow, torturous, brutal death. And that's what Jesus does. He goes to the cross. The Bible tells us when Jesus died on Good Friday, there was an earthquake. The veil that covered the Holy of Holies in the temple was exposed for the first time. Joseph of Arimathea, who is one of Jesus' followers, uses his influence and collects Jesus' body and puts him in a tomb that's empty just so he can store Jesus for the three days because Passover is about to begin at sundown and they need to get his body in quickly and they figure they'll come back on Sunday and take care of it all. You see where this is going. So they put his body into this borrowed tomb. They close it up. The Romans, fearing that his disciples are gonna do something sneaky, come and place two guards at the tomb. They seal it with wax. They wanna make sure Jesus stays dead and stays there but God has other plans. Let's look at Luke 24, one through two. Excuse me, one through 12. If you're at home watching, we're gonna pop this on the screen so you can read it as well. This is the story that we celebrate this morning. But very early on Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. They found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. So they went in, but they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. And they stood there, puzzled, Two men suddenly appeared to them clothed in dazzling robes. The women were terrified and bowed with their faces to the ground. Then the men asked, why are you looking for the dead? Among the dead for someone who is alive. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. Remember what he told you back in Galilee? That the son of man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and that he would rise again on the third day. Then they remembered that he had said this. So they rushed back from the tomb to tell the, his 11 disciples and everyone else what had happened. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and several other women who told the apostles what had happened. But the story sounded like nonsense to the men, so they didn't believe it. However, Peter jumped up and ran to the tomb to look. Stooping, he peered in, and saw the empty linen wrappings. And then he went home again, wondering what had happened. 
For Christians, the fact that archaeologists have not been able to find a tomb with Jesus' body or bones in it is no surprise. Jesus is risen. You know, the essential tenet of our faith is that Jesus went into the tomb, dead, was buried, and then he rose again three days later, as he said. This fact, this resurrection of Jesus Christ is the foundation of our Christian faith. In fact, it's so important that the Apostle Paul says, without it, we have nothing. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 15, 17. If Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. Now, why did people hate Jesus so much? I mean, he did amazing things. He healed people, people who needed his help. He healed people who didn't even ask for it. He had that much compassion and love on him. But the religious leaders and others were starting to grow jealous of Jesus' influence, of his power, of his teaching. They really grew jealous of the fact that the crowds were now following Jesus instead of them. But what was it that Jesus said that got them so upset? Well, by the end of his ministry, when he knew his time was short, he was much more plain than he was having to hide it in the beginning. Otherwise, he would have never had three years of ministry. He claimed to be God in the flesh. He claimed to be the only way to God. He claimed that he was the atonement for sin once and for all. He also claimed that he would be tried, arrested, beaten, and killed. And on the third day, he would rise again. This is Luke 24, 46 through 47. Jesus said, yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. It was also written that this message would be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all the nations. Beginning in Jerusalem, there is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. In today's passage of the women going to the empty tomb and then Peter following up quickly, we have the culmination of Jesus' promise here. To tell, you the, to tell you the truth, what I love most about this passage is its brutal honesty. I mean, Jesus' disciples have been following him for three years. It's like a master's course where you're living with your professor the entire time. He's taught them, he's led them, he's prayed with them, he's healed in front of them. He even, just a few weeks earlier, had raised Lazarus from the dead. And most recently, he had explained to his disciples at their final Passover supper of who he was. And he said it plainly and what was about to take place. And then everything Jesus said happened, which is why we celebrate Easter. But look at the words that are used to describe what the disciples and the women who went to the tomb and Peter were experiencing on that first Easter morning. They were puzzled. They were terrified. They thought, the words that the women brought back from the tomb were nonsense. And Peter, the one who had the most insight of all the disciples because he was with Jesus, he was the one Jesus said, Peter, you are the rock and on this rock I will build my church. Peter pops his head into that little cave. He sees the empty linens laying there and he wonders what happened. Three years, three years of learning from Jesus. He knew what Jesus said about himself but at the last moment, he could not fathom what was going on. That was the first Easter morning. Now, like most of you here, I have family members and friends who are at church or have been to church already this morning. But I also have family members who don't believe that Jesus died and rose again. I also have family members and friends who believe Jesus died and rose again but it really has no impact on their lives. And frankly, they're not alone. There's an organization called Ligonier Ministries, and they've been sponsoring a survey called the, the State of Theology in America, and they've been doing this for several years. Last year, they sponsored this, uh, this, this survey, and they had some really interesting results. They surveyed over 3,000 people, cross-section of America, believers, non-believers, all different racial, ethnic, uh, social income, all of that stuff. When they got the survey results back and compiled it, they discovered that about two-thirds, 66% of the respondents said 
They believed that the biblical account of Jesus' resurrection is accurate. However, despite believing the biblical accounts of Jesus' resurrection, many of the respondents said also that they saw little or no connection with the resurrection and their daily lives. They believe Jesus rose from the dead on the first Easter Sunday. They're just not that sure that it matters much. Now, the State of Theology survey also found that 53 of the respondents came back and said that the Bible is not literally true. 40% said that modern science disproves the Bible. But here's one that really grabbed me. It said 32% of the respondents said God is unconcerned with their day-to-day decisions. So why the disconnect? Why do so many people, if this is supposed to be an average reflecting America, if 66% of the people believe that Jesus rose from the dead on the third day, why do so few believe that God is concerned with their day-to-day lives? What's the disconnect? Over the years, uh, through conversations, whether it's been after church on Sunday or weddings and funerals where I get into some really good conversations, some of the doubts and disconnects that people have with the faith, you know, the claims of Christianity, uh, the things that I really struggle with about Easter, about Jesus, that's when it usually comes out. And over the years, I've been a pastor quite a long time, uh, it basically kind of boils down to three questions people have about the faith, especially when it comes to the Easter time. Was Jesus real? Was Jesus' death necessary? And did Jesus' resurrection really happen? I've had variations of that question almost every time. The fourth one I didn't put down is, and I could tell how many times when the, this gentleman comes to church, he said, I come to church every Easter, why do you always preach the same thing? And so, <laughs> like, come back at Christmas, it changes. Um, but you know, these are really great questions. Was Jesus real? Was his death necessary? Was the resurrection necessary? I encourage people to ask questions, but I also encourage them to look for the answers. You know, don't just ask the question and then do nothing with it. I'm sure there's probably a few people here this morning who are wondering these same questions. I appreciate that. So let me tackle this first question. Was Jesus real? This is probably the easiest question to answer because it's a really emphatic yes. Um, and it's easy because we know of Jesus' life from the Bible, but there are so many extra-biblical resources, many people who wrote, who weren't writing for the Bible, in fact, people who did not like Jesus and did not like Christianity, they also wrote about this man named Jesus from the first century who claimed to be the Messiah and did miracles and had followers who continued to proclaim his teachings even after he was killed. One of the most well-known is a gentleman by the name of Josephus, who was a Jewish historian who wrote for the Romans. And he writes about Jesus and what his followers said of him. But one of the more amazing ones happened in 54 AD. Uh, There was a, a Roman historian named Tacticus. And Tacticus was no friend of Jesus or Christianity. In fact, he could not stand it. He later became a governor in what is now modern-day Turkey. But in 54 AD, in his book called Annals, he writes this, and he's writing about this growing popularity of Christianity a few years, so it's 54, and Jesus, you know, somewhere closer in the 35 to 40 region. You know, this is about 15, 16 years after Jesus' death on the cross. He starts writing about how annoying it is that this Christian movement continues to grow even in Rome. Here's what he writes. Christus, which is the Latin form of Jesus' name, the Christ, Christus from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, uh, procurators, Pontius Pilate, and a most mischievous superstition, thus checked for the moment, again broke out not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, not really a big fan, but even in Rome, where all these hideous and shameful things from every part of the world find their center and become popular. That's very old Roman speak for saying, what happened in Judea spread to Rome and it's growing and I'm not happy. And he writes about it. 
So if this Roman who hates Jesus, hates Christianity, is annoyed by the number of Christians that are growing in his hometown in Rome, writes that there was a Jesus and his followers keep growing despite the fact that he was killed on the cross, that's pretty good proof Jesus actually lived. In fact, if you look academically, there is little doubt among even skeptics that Jesus existed. I haven't found anyone yet who denies that he existed. But what people struggle with is what we know about Jesus, is it true? Now Mark, who was one of the followers of Jesus, wrote the first gospel. We, we believe that Peter, who was uh, firsthand with Jesus, gave Mark most of his firsthand information. But here's the thing. Mark wrote the first gospel, the gospel of Mark, about 35 or 40 years after Jesus' death. As I said, Peter filled him in on the, on the details. Mark knew Jesus. Uh, as, mid, as did many of the people who were still alive, who were with Jesus during his ministry, heard him speak, saw the miracles, knew what he said. They watched him be persecuted, tried, died on the cross. And also the Bible tells us, all four of the Gospels, in fact, tell us that over 500 claim that in one day they saw Jesus alive after the resurrection. Now, Mark and the Gospel writers didn't make this up. It had only been 40 years since Jesus' crucifixion, and too many people were still alive who could have said, that didn't happen, or that couldn't have happened. Instead, they said, yeah, we were there. We saw it. We know that to be true. It was only 40 years. To put this in perspective for you, 40 years ago from today was 1984. In 1984, actor Richard Burton, singer Ethel Merman, and musician Count Basie all passed away. Many of us were alive when they were still alive, these entertainers, so we know they're real, we know they existed. You know, if, if you were fortunate, you, you maybe got to see them in person or at least saw their movies. But can you imagine if someone wanted to, let's say, to make up something about them that wasn't true? Imagine someone, a filmmaker, deciding to make a documentary on Richard Burton claiming that he never married Elizabeth Taylor. Once, not, let alone twice. Or that Ethel Merman couldn't sing and hated Broadway. Or that Count Basie, the King of Swing, actually hated music. You know, it would be ridiculed. Too many people alive knew of them, or heard them, or saw their movies, or listened to them sing. They enjoyed their talents. There's too much evidence to refute claims that these people didn't do what they said and here. And the same is with Jesus in these gospel accounts of his ministry. We know that people hung on every word that Jesus said. They were a culture. I mean, they didn't have cell phones holding up recording. You, know, you imagine if Jesus were in today, he'd be on TikTok, he'd be banned. Uh, you know, just, <laughs> you know, we would have so much evidence. But in, a, in their co uh, culture, it was an auditory culture. So they, they actually listened and they memorized and they wrote down Thing. So people hung on Jesus' word, they memorized what they said, they taught them to their friends and to their neighbors. You know, they didn't have TV or streaming, so this was entertainment. But they witnessed his miracles. See, it wasn't just, hey, here's what I heard about Jesus. There were many people around that saw what happened, and they were witnesses and testified. Yeah, they saw Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead, or they saw him heal a girl who was sick and thought to be dead, or they healed a widow's son. The amazing things that Jesus did. And because of that, the word spread. But these same people also saw Jesus die. And three days later, saw him alive again, teaching and preaching, and even eating with them. We'll talk about that next week when we finish this series looking at the road to Emmaus. And when the pressure to be a follower of Jesus, this is really important, when the pressure to follow Jesus became so great that to believe in him and teach his ways meant certain death, many of Jesus' followers continued to preach and chose death because they knew eternal life was the next chapter. So there's really no question, was Jesus a real person? The next two questions, though, you really could, they go together. Was Jesus' death necessary? And did the resurrection really happen? So why did Jesus have to die? I think this may be the question that troubles more people in conversations, that this comes up a lot. It's like, yeah, I believe in Jesus, you know, I believe in the resurrection, but why death? Wasn't there another way to do this? 
Well, many good and righteous people have come with a message of hope. You know, throughout the history of the world, there are people who come in, in the name of love, come in, uh, come in peace, they have great messages. Sometimes they're even killed because they're giving a message to an audience that does not want to listen to what they're talking about and does not want them to continue that message. Jesus knew this from the beginning. He knew that before he said his, preached his first sermon, before he even turned water into wine, which was his first recorded miracle, he knew that he came to die for our sins. That's why he came and taught and did miracles. Listen to what Jesus said about himself. This is Mark 10, 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is Jesus' mission statement right off the bat. He came so that we might have life. No question. But why would he have to do that? Well, Jesus knew we are people of great sin. And I know that probably rustles some people the wrong way because, let's face it, most of us think we are good people. And we are. But good is not enough in God's kingdom for salvation. Because few people think of themselves as sinner. We think we are good people and that we are good enough. But when some religious leaders try to trap Jesus and they try to get him to say something that they know that they can get him arrested for, an expert in the religious laws asked Jesus, what's the most important commandment there is? And they're doing this as a trap. But Jesus' answer is very telling for us in this situation. This is Matthew 22, 37 through 40. Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. And this is a scandalous statement as far as the religious leaders say. Jesus says, the entire law and the demands of all the prophets are based on these two commandments. You see, the problem with thinking that we are good enough on our own is that we will always fall short of what God requires. I mean, think about it this week. Did you love God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul? Did you think of God every day, every hour? Did you love God last week with all your time, all your love, all your mind, all your will, all your resources? And if you did manage to do that, I'm going to give you this candy bar, <laughs> first of all. <laughs> but if you did manage to do that, can you honestly say that you loved your neighbor, every neighbor, as yourself last week? And by neighbor, Jesus doesn't mean the people who live next to you and the empty houses that are all around you, like most of us in Teal. I love my neighbor, he's never there. <laughs> it's like, I mean, think about it. This is an election year. Can you really say that you love the people who disagree with you as much as yourself? I can't. <laughs> and that's the point. We can't be good enough on our own. We need another way. And Jesus is that way. In fact, Jesus says he's the only way. He claims to be God in the flesh. And that's why the religious leaders wanted to kill him. In the Bible, God establishes the rules and then provides a way back to him. This is Romans 3, 21 through 26. It is an amazing passage from Paul. He writes, but now God has shown us a way to be made right with him meaning God, without keeping the requirements of the law as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are, which was an amazing statement for a Jew back in that day, to say that others can be included as well. And 23, for everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past. 
for he was looking ahead and including them in what he would do in the present time. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness, for he himself is fair and just, and he makes sinners right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. And this leads us to the third question I get asked. Did Jesus' resurrection really happen? Now, I can't point to any scientific evidence about Jesus' resurrection, mainly because science falls short when it comes to miracles. It's kind of the nature of miracles. Miracles are an anomaly. Science can't explain it. You know, science looks at facts. Is it repeatable? Is it, is it logical? But I'll tell you, we have people in the sanctuary this morning who are walking miracles. People who are told that because of illnesses and disease that they had little chance of survival. Yet God had a different plan. Believers prayed for them and the disease went away and science had no explanation. But scripture did. History may be a better source for proving Jesus' resurrection. As I said up front, Jesus was hated by the, the Jews, uh, well, I should say the, the religious leaders. Uh, the early church was Jewish. But the Romans hated and killed Jesus, and many of his followers as well. And history records this. Under Emperor Nero, Christians were blamed for the great fire that ripped through Rome and destroyed most of it. And so, in a way to kind of deflect his own inadequacies and pass blame on for this fire, Emperor Nero blamed Christians. And here's what, how he blamed Christians. He said, Christians only worship one God. In fact, he called them atheists because they denied all the gods of Rome. And Nero said, because they deny the Roman gods, the gods have punished us. They burnt Rome down. It's their fault. Therefore, we should punish Christians. And people bought it. So Christians became Nero's scapegoat, and they were brutally sought out and tried and beaten, and many were killed for their faith. Now, I gave you a quote from Tacticus earlier. There, there's a second part of that same quote, and this is what it said. Tacticus gives us a great historical perspective for what was going on at that time. He says, accordingly, an arrest was first made of all who pleaded guilty, in other words, those who said they were Christian, and upon their information, an immense multitude was convicted, not so much of the crime of firing the city or burning down Rome, but as of the hatred against mankind. Mockery of every sort was added to their deaths. He's talking about Christians here. We covered, their, uh, covered with the skins of beasts. They were torn by dogs and perished, or they were nailed to crosses, or they were doomed to the flames and burnt to serve as nightly illumination when daylight had expired. So here's the historical question to ponder this morning when considering the truth of Jesus' resurrection. Why did Jesus' movement flourish and multiply after his death? Especially when the punishment for promoting Jesus' teachings was death. Why did 11 of the 12 disciples willingly preach this gospel that Jesus gave them knowing that they would probably be killed, and they were. Eleven were killed. The twelfth, John, was arrested and put on the island of Patmos where he wrote Revelation, which caused uh, even more faith and belief. But why would they do this if they knew the resurrection was a hoax? Why did so many earlier believers endure horrible ridicule and cruel deaths as Tacticus describes? I mean, what he's describing here are the games that were in the Colosseum of putting animal skins over Christians with the blood and the meat still on the skin so that the dog, wild dogs, would come and rip them apart as they got into the skin? Or why would they be nailed to the cross like Jesus was and mocked? Or why would they be allowed to be burned to the death and even goes on to describe how Nero used to dip them in boiling wax while they were alive, put them up on a pole and light them at fire at night, not only as lamppost, but as a warning to anybody who would want to follow Jesus Christ. Why would they knowingly do that within their lifetime of having seen Jesus go to the cross, die, and then claim he rose again if it didn't happen? That's why I think history can be a great evidence for us of did the resurrection really happen? 
Why would they continue to spread the teachings of Jesus if they knew Jesus never rose from the dead as he promised? They wouldn't. When Jesus clears the temple of the money changers who were blocking the only area the Gentiles were allowed to pray at, which was called the gate of the Gentiles, Jesus demands an ex, or Jesus turns over everything, and the, the religious leaders are furious. They demand to know from him, by whose authority are you doing this? Show us a miracle to prove that you have the authority to kick everybody out. And here's what Jesus says. This is John 2, 18 through 22. The religious leaders demanded, what are you doing? If God gave you authority to do this, show us a miraculous sign to prove it. All right, Jesus replied. Destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it up. Now, this would be like, I mean, if, at that time, Herod had been building and adding on to the temple for 40 years. You talk about a long project. I mean, many of us have driven down the 101 heading south towards Los Angeles. My son went to school in Santa Barbara. So for at least 12 years ago, we've been driving up the 101 through construction, through Carpinteria. Can you imagine if all of that finally gets fixed, and Jesus says, tear this road apart, and three days again, I'll build it up. You know, we'd laugh at him, say, it's, it's been 20 years, and it's still horrible. <laughs> and that's what they thought he was talking about, even his disciples. But Jesus was really saying, the temple soon will no longer be necessary. I will take the place of the temple. I will be killed, but three days later, I'll rise again and rebuild this temple, because he is the temple. And he goes on to say, uh, they go on to say, what, it's, been take, it's taken 46 years to build this temple, and you can rebuild it in three days. But when Jesus said this temple, he meant his own body. And then in verse 22, after he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered he had said this, and they believed both the scriptures and what Jesus had said. Friends, on this Easter Sunday, we boldly and proudly proclaim that Jesus is real that he took on our sins and died horrific death, but three days later he rose from the dead as he said he would, so that death and sin would be defeated for anyone who asks, regardless of tribe or family background, so that anyone who asks may live in the kingdom of God forever. That's the promise of Easter. That is the hope and the celebration that we proclaim today. It's the power and promise of Jesus' resurrection. Now, the, the claims of Jesus may leave you puzzled or terrified, or maybe the thought of needing salvation is nonsense to you, but here's where you get to decide what happens next. As I said, Jesus very plainly said, he is God. He says to his disciples, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. He said, if we believe in him, our sins would be forgiven and we will be saved. So the question for you this morning is, will you believe and follow him in a new life filled with God's hope and joy? Or do you want to maintain the status quo and hope for the best? Friends, I can tell you from my life and the lives of so many, Jesus was real. Jesus' death was necessary. And Jesus' resurrection really did happen. You may know a lot about Jesus, do you really know Jesus? Is Jesus' life, death, and resurrection just a historical footnote for you? Or is it your hope in life and death? Friends, I encourage you to get to know Jesus this Easter. Follow him. Take him up on his offer to give you a new life of purpose and hope, both now and forever. You see, too many people come away from Easter celebrations the same way not expecting any change, not expecting to meet the Savior who has risen. But today is different. Jesus has different plans for you. Jesus said in John 3, 16, 17, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And then later in John eleven twenty five twenty six, 26, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. And then he asked his disciples, do you believe this? So my question for you is, how will you live differently 
from this point on, knowing that God loves you so much that he died for you, and then he rose, taking your sin so that you may live life with him. How is that going to change your life today? Friends, Christ has risen. Go ahead, you can say it. You Tell you all our Presbyterians. Okay, <laughs> would you pray with me? God, we are so grateful for this life that you offer. We were dead in our sins. We had no way of approaching you. But because you went to the cross willingly, you took our sins. You took our sins into death and rose again, leaving our sins in death. We do not have to follow those. You offer us a new life. You promise your Holy Spirit to give us love, hope, peace, patience, joy, gentleness, and self-control, ways so that we might live a different way to live out your gospel as well as share it. I pray for anyone here this morning who's still questioning whether you were real, whether your salvation was necessary, whether it's even worth it. I pray that you would make yourself known to them in a mighty way so that he or she might be able to come to you and seek you, knowing that we don't have to come with all the answers. In fact, you say, just come as we are, that you may reveal yourself to us, that we may know your joy, live in your peace, and love you and one another. God, I pray this morning for those of us who have known you for a long time that this Easter Sunday, this might be a time of rededication and renewal, that we might be empowered, just sharing and basking in your glory, knowing that despite who we are, despite what we've done, you love us and call us and have given us the invitation to come and to be sons and daughters in your kingdom. God, we thank you for Easter Sunday and the power of the resurrection that changes us, not because we deserved it, but because you love us and desire to be with us forever. Help that to sink into our lives so that your resurrection actually means something in our day-to-day -day living. I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand you're able as we sing our final? Oh, excuse me.
As I said up top, we're going to go in just a few moments over to the fellowship hall where we have time for our coffee and there's wonderful treats over there. You are all invited. In fact, they went all out for this Sunday and invite you to, to go and join us over there right after the service. Just a couple quick announcements. Uh, we have Bible study every Wednesday. The men meet at 8 o'clock and the women meet at 2.30 in the afternoon in the same room in the fellowship hall. We're finishing up the book of Daniel, but you are welcome to join us in. Uh, we're in those prophetic parts of Daniel that can be a little tricky to get through, and that's why we're going through them together. We do this every Wednesday. If you want to grow in your faith, studying the scripture is the best way to do so, and I invite you to come out and join us. Also, if you look in your bulletin, uh, many people ask this, so I'm just going to tell you since there's a lot of you here today. Our next thrift shop sale is April 19th and 20. We always are looking for people who are willing to help us out with this. It is a wonderful task. But what most people don't realize is that the majority of the profits for that go back into our community to helping organizations like CAN and the, the neighborhood bus that goes around and uh, with the food ministry that we have that we've partnered with other churches in town to feed those, of, uh, those in Cambria and San Simeon who are below the poverty line and rely on our gifts to be able to survive. So right now we are currently collecting food. Um, they've asked for protein, canned proteins like tuna, chicken, um, hold off on the caviar. Apparently that's not really popular, uh, but I know some people here that will take it for you. But we're doing that. There's baskets out in the front. Uh, for those of you who support the ministry of our church, there are boxes in the back uh, to put your tithes and offerings for our guests. If you're watching us online, you can go to our website, which is cambriapress.org. There's a little green button up in the right corner. You can press that and give online if you'd like to as well. I do want to thank all the people who participated today. Adelina, the 12-year-old phenom, for playing harp. Our worship team that came up and played, and Travis Surratt, where are you, Travis, over there? She decorated everything, and she was this morning gluing in the cross and making that look amazing. So thank you for all that you have done. 
One last thing, if you look on the back of our bulletin, there are dedications that people have purchased these uh, Easter lilies in memory of people or to honor people. You can see who those were. But I want to remind you, if you did, uh, if, if this is one of you on here, you please come and take your, uh, your Easter lily today. Uh, anything that's left behind, we're going to give to some of our shut-ins because I get really allergic, and next week I'll just be sneezing through the whole thing. So please, take your, your Easter lily with you. That's why they're here, and we're so grateful that you helped and participate in that. So let me send you out now with this good word. This was written by an anonymous person. We, we don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews, but it is a powerful book of faith. And this is Hebrews 13, 20 through 21. I'll invite you to stay if you'd like to. Listen as the Brass Quartet has our postlude, and then we're going to go over and enjoy each other's company and some great treats over in the Fellowship Hall. And I encourage you to come join us. Let me send you out now with this good word. Hebrews 13, 20 and 21. Now may the God of peace, who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, and ratified an eternal covenant with his blood, may he equip you with all you need for doing his will. May he produce in you through the power of Jesus Christ every good thing that is pleasing to him. All glory to him forever and ever. God bless you all. It has been a privilege worshiping with you on this Easter Sunday. I hope to see you again next week as we conclude this series looking at Jesus' walk on the road to Emmaus. God bless you, and I'll see you over in the fellowship hall.